Wonderful. Well, thank you for being so flexible with us and great to be together today. If you turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14, John chapter 14, I've loved doing this series called The End, talking about the beauty and glory of Jesus in the end times, and this will be our last installment of that series. You know, my personality lends itself to escapism. I can remember as early as high school, I would sit in my math classes, of course it was math classes, just dreaming about being anywhere else. I was always plotting different adventures and, and getaways, camping trips for, for me and my friends. And uh, the funny thing is, now there's actually a whole industry uh, capitalizing on this called escape rooms. So just this, this love and passion of escaping things. The funny thing is my, my wife will consistently have this thought, you know, what can we do as a family bonding experience? And she'll say, let's go to an escape room. I'm such an escapist that the thought of paying money, though, to be confined to a tiny room, even to, to, to have the chance to get out of it, it sounds awful to me. And so in, in case you're not familiar with what escapism is, Here's the dictionary definition. Escapism is the tendency to seek distraction and relief from unpleasant realities, especially by seeking entertainment or engaging in fantasy. Here's the Wikipedia definition. Escapism is a mental diversion from unpleasant or boring aspects of daily life, typically through activities involving imagination or entertainment. Escapism may be used to occupy oneself away from the persistent feelings of depression or general sadness. So let's be really honest for a minute. Uh, if you would say, yeah, I think I can lend myself to escapism. Just raise your hand to me. Yeah, that look, almost everyone, man, last, last night in the Saturday night service, I think everyone was raising their hands. I actually could feel as people in their homes that were streaming online were raising <laughs> their hands with me. <laughs> Who doesn't want to escape when it's 111 outside? And fires are burning. Um, so changing gears for a moment, as I'm, I'm reading the news, I, I, I do study the news, not because I just love the news, but because I, I, I want to be informed. I want to understand what's going on in our world. I want to be a good shepherd and guiding people through it. I'll always go through about five different news sites. I encourage you to not just get your news from one site. Um, so I always want to know what the right's saying, so I, I'll read Fox News. I want to know what the left's saying. I'll read CNN. Then I'll go to a Christian news station. Highly encourage you to tune in to Christian news with CBN. I'll look at Christianity Today, Christian Post. And then I'll always also look at Jerusalem Post because I want to know what's going on in Israel. So after I look at all those things, I was pretty discouraged this week. Uh, there was some bad news uh, this week. And man, if there's been a year that we've gotten bad news, 2020, obviously really challenging with the pandemic continuing to go on. Obviously, the racial pain has broken our hearts. Violence continues to escalate. You know, I'm looking at numerous cities burning right now, but then some just terrific news for California. A couple of bills were passed. I don't know if you know about these, uh, but always want to share these things so we can be intercessors, watchmen on the wall. There was a bill passed this week removing, uh, criminalizing uh, penalties for sexual acts with minors. Awful. Um, there's been a legalization of uh, hormone and even surgery for minors for gender transitioning. Um, these, uh, and then here's another one. It was just out, just bizarre. Uh, I, I watched this, this clip of Elon Musk talking about putting a, a, a technical device in the back of your skull to be able to project a, a thousand TV stations and to replay memories. And then he says, you know, you wouldn't even be able to see it. In fact, I might have it right now. And I'm going, what is happening? in our world right now. And here was, to be honest, my thought. The thought I had was, I just want to get on a horse, me and my family, and ride off into the wilderness, leaving my iPhone and my iPad 
And just to suggest, this isn't something to clap for. You do not want your pastor to ride off <laughs> into the wilderness. I don't know. I don't know if that would be appealing to you. To some of you, that, that thought of riding a horse into the wilderness would be awful. <laughs> but my, my thought was, I want to escape. And so as I'm, I'm studying escapism this week, there was actually this recent article written here it is. It was called The Great Escape, Exploring the Good and Bad of Escapism. And I was cracking up as it says all these Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are actually plotting their escape to New Zealand as America is breaking down. Anybody been dreaming about New Zealand <laughs> lately? I told my wife that. She was like, ooh, that sounds good, right? Or Lord of the Rings was shot. This is what the quote said. And it often, I, this was fascinating. Often escapism is dismissed as a character flaw, a refusal to face up to reality. I think about the show, uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Worse, some forms of escapism, addictive drugs, for example, can trap people in self-destructive cycle that only diminishes their quality of life. We need to be careful not to indulge our escapist urges too much in case we lose touch with reality. Now listen to this. This was intriguing. Yet in some respects, escapism is absolutely vital in helping us to live well and for society to make progress. Good forms of escapism emancipate us and allow us to grow and aspire to dreams of a better self and a better society. What you say? I actually want to say that this author of this article was tapping into something biblical this morning. I want to make a case for Christian escapism. And that's how we're going to end this last message of the end times as I talk about the great escape. Because this is what Jesus said. I love this. John 14. I told you together, would you open your apps or your Bibles? I want you to highlight this because Jesus understood that for his people there would be bad times. And this is what he spoke to us to encourage our hearts. He says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Man, if there's a word we need in 2020, there's a word you need before the 2020 elections. If there's a word you need when your heart is breaking because of the racial pain or the violence There's a word we need as you see things just going totally messed up with how people see themselves and and what's happening to children and what's happening in countries. Jesus speaks into the problems and says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, and here is his proposal for us. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. The great news for Christians is this world, in all its pain, in all its sorrow, in the state it's in today, is not our end destination. There is a great escape. And I want to tell you that escapism and that mental state of escapism will lift you above depression and loneliness and despair as you lock in on the promise that Jesus gives to us. You got to understand there is bad news. I'm not talking about some naive, overly optimistic, some people would call it Pollyannaism, if you know the Disney movie. Matthew 24, Jesus said it was going to get bad. He said this, you will hear of wars. We've been talking about this in Matthew 24, 6, every week. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's happening. But see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation. Actually, if you look at the Greek of that, that's ethnos, 
against ethnos, that's ethnicity against ethnicity. He actually prophesied there will be racial pain and division. That's not something we're okay with. We are contending for unity, the equality, the value of all peoples, but he said it's going to happen. And kingdom against kingdom, that of course is happening. There will be famines, that's happening, and earthquakes, that's happening, especially here in various places. All of these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. My goodness, is that happening for Christians worldwide right now? And you will be hated by all nations because of me. Many are sensing a greater increase in hatred and persecution of Christians. At that time, many will turn away from their faith. Heartbreakingly, that is happening. It says this, and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Kendall talked about that last week. Because of the increase of wickedness, we see that as well. The love of most will grow cold. It's sad. It's scary. It's painful. And that's why we find this great solace in the 150 chapters in the Bible about the end times. Because although many things happen that are dismal and horrifying, you come to scriptures like this in the book of Isaiah. You know, the scriptures about the end times are not just in the New Testament. It's not just in Revelation, although that's where we're going to camp the majority this morning. I want to just give you a little foretaste from Isaiah chapter 2. Listen to this great news. This is what, the, what Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. For 2,000 years, Israel, and namely Jerusalem, was destroyed. It didn't belong to the Israelites. I was there last summer. Can I tell you, now the nations are streaming for the first time in 2,000 years, we would pull up to a site like the Garden of Gethsemane, and there would be a bus from Nigeria, a bus from Kenya, a bus from South Africa, a bus from Chile, a bus from Argentina, a bus from Brazil, a bus from China, a bus from South Korea, a bus from Russia. It, the nations are straight. This is happening in your day, beloved, and it's going to happen more and more. Many people will come and say, come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his way so that we may walk in his path. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Why? Because Jesus will reign from there. He will judge between nations and settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. The violence is getting worse, but there is coming a time where there will be no more violence. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. There's this scene in the last installment of the Lord of the Rings, and Gandalf is looking out over the Morador. It's getting all dark, and he's sitting there with a little hobbit, and the hobbit's all afraid. And I love it. He, he says, it's always darkest before dawn. That's actually a quote from Thomas Fuller in 1650. It's always darkest just before the day dawneth. And let me tell you, that is what is beginning to unfold before our eyes. It's the same in the book of Revelation. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles now to Revelation, I'm going to attempt in the, about 20 minutes to give you a summary of the whole book. Here's the reason many Christians have been afraid of the book of Revelation. Many Christians avoid it. I want to tell you it's one of the most glorious books. <clears throat> There's actually promises for those who read the book of Revelation. I encourage you, dive into it. You are going to find such delight, such joy. But let me unpack it for you. First of all, camp out in Revelation 1 and Revelation 4 because they're all about the glory and splendor of the God-man Christ Jesus. You see his eyes of fire. You see his face like shining like the sun. There is such an intrigue with the supernatural. There's such a hunger for superheroes. They pale in comparison to the depiction of the glorified Christ. 
And so watch it. Listen to it. It's supernatural. The sound of multitude, the voice like rushing water, a sword coming out from his mouth. When John sees him, he falls as though dead. We move to Revelation 4. We see the same picture. He is on a throne. You might think that everything's out of control, but no, Jesus is on a throne, and he holds history in his hand. There's a, a sea of glass. There's a river of fire coming from that throne. You read that. If your heart is a little cold, if you're, if you're a little bored in your faith, jump into Revelation 1 and Revelation 4. 2 and 3, Revelation 2 and 3, are instructions to the churches. They're instructions to the seven churches that were in Turkey at the time, but they're instructions for us now. And the instruction for us is don't let your hearts grow cold. Don't live for this earth. It's all about being on fire for Jesus. That's what he wants. If you want to know what he wants from you in the end times, it's an on fire heart full of love and passion for him. Ask him to do it in your heart. I tell you, as things get worse, it's actually easier to fall more in love with Jesus because we're less distracted because we realize I can't hold on to anything because everything's just flipping, falling through my fingers. It's a great time to fall in love with Jesus, people. We move to Revelation chapter 5, and this is actually good news because we see that all of history is wrapped up in this scroll. A scroll is just like a book, but that's what they used to have in ancient times, these scrolls that were rolled up, and it's sealed. And on these seals, John sees it, and he's heartbroken because no one can open it. And then he sees a lamb that was slain. That lamb is Jesus. And Jesus is the only one in the universe with the power to break the seals. And so we're going to see seven seals. So what you need to understand is everything that happens on the earth is allowed by Jesus. It has to go through his hand of sovereignty, his filter. Now watch this because these seals are pretty bad. They're a bummer. There's going to first be these four horsemen. Seal one is a rider bent on conquest, most believed to be the Antichrist. What we know is that before the rapture happens, according to the book of Thessalonians, the Antichrist comes first. So there's a rider bent on conquest. Seal number two, a rider with the power to take peace from the earth and people kill each other. So the violence will get worse. Seal three, a rider with scales declaring a famine and great inflation. Uh, seal four, a fourth rider named death. One fourth of the earth is killed by sword, famine, plague, and beast. Seal five, those killed because they live for God cry out, oh God, won't you avenge us? We talked about that in one of our messages past. Seal six, there are these signs in the sky. The moon turned to blood, stars falling, mountains shaking. And then seal six, after that, we see two very important things that we've been talking about, and this is our role to play. There's a great ingathering of Israel, a great ingathering of the Jewish people, 12,000 people from each of the 12 tribes, 144,000. I don't believe that's an exact number. I believe that that's a prophetic number, but here's what we know. There will be a great harvest of Israel. We know that from Romans chapter 11, and we know from Romans chapter 11, if there's a great harvest in Israel, it will also release a great blessing to all the Gentiles, to all the rest of us that aren't Jews. And that's what we see in Revelation 7. Are you following me? I know I'm going really fast. Watch this. This is going to encourage you. This is great news in the midst of a ton of pain in Revelation. After this, I looked and before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation. What nation? Every nation people and language and tribe standing before the throne and before the Lamb. You take what you think is the hardest nation right now, Iran. Do you know that revival is tearing across Iran right now? The oppressive government can't do anything compared to Jesus. There are so many people coming to the Lord in Iran. How about Afghanistan? Do you know that the church is multiplying in Afghanistan like never before in history? How about North Korea? Yes, it's happening there. How about China? Greatest revival in history is happening in China right now. Jesus is on his throne. And the nations are coming. And people from every kindred, nation, tribe, and tongue will here. And that's our job. Don't just hole up in your little cave as the people of God and go, just get me out of here. No, our job, be on fire for Jesus, pray for Israel, and preach the gospel to all nations. That's our role. That's why we're called All People's Church. 
They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God and to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the disciple John asked this question. He asked, who are these people? And the elder says, this is Revelation 7, 13 through 17. The one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I've talked to you about a rapture, and I believe with all my heart that a wonderful, beautiful time where Jesus comes, according to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, Luke, chapter 21, 2 Thessalonians, Jesus is going to appear. He's coming back in human form and bodily form, and those that believe in him will be rapture taken up. Now, am I 100% sure it's going to happen before the great tribulation? Uh, I'm not. Because of verses like this, these are the ones who went through the great tribulation. But let me tell you this, I am convinced you are not going to go through the wrath of God. I am a pre-wrath rapture person. I'd love it, man, if we get out of the great tribulation. Yes. Just not sure about that one, so I do want to tell you about all that's coming. But you are not destined for the wrath of God. It says they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them in 111 degrees in San Diego. It's a good word. Nor any scorching heat for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. If this has been a painful year, you are headed towards a time where God's going to wipe away every tear from your eye. If you haven't had the food you want, you're going to have a feast. Oh, man, if you you know, are a fan of water like my wife is. She's always wanting the best water. She's not okay with just faucet water. I mean, the water in heaven. If you like bubbly water, I think the water will be bubbly for you. If you like Fijian water at, on tap there, you're like more of a kombucha person, a heavenly kombucha. So then we move. Um, that was Revelation 5 through 7. We get to this uh, place where there are these seven seals. So now you're going to see the seven seals and the seven bowls. Now this is different. Where the, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the trumpets and the bowls, where the seals were these God allowed thing, now we're going to actually see the wrath of God poured out. So watch this. Uh, there was a seventh seal first. There's a, a half hour of silence in heaven. Then we move to Revelation chapter 8. Uh, the first seal, I mean, I'm sorry, wow, I keep messing that up. For the first trumpet, hail, fire, and blood will rain down on the earth and wipe out one-third of all plant life. The second trumpet, Revelation 8.8, 8, a burning mountain falls into the sea, turns one-third of the ocean to blood, and one-third of all sea life dies. These are the actual judgments now coming from the Lord. The third trumpet, a star called Wormwood, poisons one-third of all fresh water supply. The fourth trumpet, one-third of the moon, stars and darkness are fallen. The fifth trumpet, Revelation 9, these locusts with human faces, long hair, lion's teeth, and the power of scorpions sting plague, and they're stinging unbelievers for five months and um, rough. The sixth trumpet, uh, these fallen angels are released and wipe out people from sulfur and fire pouring out of their mouths. They manage to wipe out one third of mankind. The seventh trumpet, there's this other break from the plagues. And the 24 elders in heaven declare it's time to destroy those who destroy the earth. You see, God is love. And God loves us so much that he sent his son to actually take his wrath upon himself. That's when he died on the cross, he, he purchased your salvation. He took the wrath, and God offers it freely to every person. But for those who hate God, 
for those who partner with Satan, that is what these judgments that come upon the earth transpire upon. It's not for you. This is Revelation 9. It says this in verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. You see, God is always offering an opportunity for people to repent. Repent means change your mind and change your direction. There's always another opportunity. But for those who continue, listen to what it says, they did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons. That is dumb to worship demons. That is not smart to worship demons. Demons steal, kill, destroy, rape, malign. And idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of all their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their theft. So let's just keep walking through the book of Revelation. We get to chapter 12. Now, if you took your iPhone and you zoom in, then you zoomed out. That's what Revelation 12 is going to be. We're going to zoom out on the course of all history, and we're going to see the, the, the great battle between good and evil. You're going to see this prophetic woman and some believe her to be Israel, some believe her to be the church, some people believe for her to be both, that gives birth to a son. This virgin woman that gives birth to a son, that of course is Jesus, but there is a dragon who is pursuing him, that is Satan. We know the great war, so this is prophetic imagery talking about the cataclysmic war for the world. We see that, and then in Revelation 13, then we zoom in on a biographical sketch of this person empowered by the dragon known as the Antichrist. We did a whole series, a whole sermon on the Antichrist. I encourage you to go listen to that. So Revelation 13 is talking about the Antichrist and how he's come to deceive the world. And there's a beast, there's a second beast known as the false prophet. They're empowered by the dragon. That is the unholy trinity, Satan, Antichrist, and false prophet. And that's what we're seeing in, in chapter 13. We're seeing in chapter 14 that people start falling prey to him. They start taking a mark of the beast in their hand or in their in their uh, head in order to be a part of his monetary system in order to buy and sell. He is taking control of the whole world. Verses uh, chapters 15 through 16, now we see a whole next dispensation of the wrath of God poured out upon those who have taken that and upon the enemy. Chapters 17 and 18 is this this plagues of wrath poured out on Satan and the Antichrist. And then, okay, you're like, man, rough. Okay, just remember chapter 19. I love chapter 19. Oh, 19, I love you. There needs to be a worship song written about our love for chapter 19. Listen to this in verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice. Say rejoice. Because, you know, there was a lot of bad stuff that was happening on the earth. And it says now, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. I love this next part. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Have you ever been to a good wedding, like a, a great wedding? I mean, we have some great weddings in San Diego because we have the best backdrop. All you have to do is face your wedding that way. <laughs> I mean, I have been to some cool weddings on the bay, on the ocean. There's these palm trees. There's this sunset, usually at 73 degrees. I pity anyone who had their wedding this weekend. But, I mean, the setting is beautiful. And then weddings. Oh, my goodness. Free food. Who doesn't love free food? Okay. And, I mean, I've been to more weddings with tri-tip. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, um, imagine you've got this beautiful setting, more beautiful than San Diego. You've got the best food, better than tri-tip. I mean, you might not be a tri-tip fan. Maybe you're a tofu fan. Imagine all the tofu for my wife, rice cakes. 
rice cake fan. I don't know what your food is. But imagine the free food. Then there's the dancing. If you're ever at a wedding with me and they have dancing, you better believe I'm going to be trying to pull my family out on that floor. We're going to kick up our heels because it's time to celebrate. I used to think that God was so boring. You know, I used to think God was the God of the pews. I miss this, that God says, no, I'm going to end this thing with a wedding ceremony. You imagine the greatest wedding, and, and, and our weddings are so puny compared to the ancient Hebrew weddings. They went on for days. I'm ready for someone to bring that back. That would be a good thing to bring back in 2020. We got nothing else to do. You might as well have a seven-day wedding. <laughs> and you want to understand, I mean, why, why did Jesus pick as his first miracle going to a wedding because it's the last thing he does. He was painting the picture of like your weddings. Oh, well, weddings are great, but your weddings, the wine runs out and, and, and he makes too much wine and it's too good. Well, I mean, talk about a lavish. Uh, I preached a message where I talked about how lavish the, the wine was, that God is a God of, of ridiculous blessing. That's what we're headed towards. We're going to be dancing. You, so many of us just think, oh, uh, we're, we're not excited about heaven because we, we genuinely think that we're going to just have this white robe and float playing a harp. And we're going to be like, dun, 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 oh, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, you're like, I really didn't even like harp that much on earth, but now I have to do this for a billion years. <laughs> like, hey, Sam, <laughs> hey, nice harp. Dun, 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 dun. That is not what we're headed towards. <laughs> No, you take the greatest party, and that's what we're going towards. You take the greatest food. You take the greatest drink. You take the greatest celebration, and that is how this whole thing begins. And how much greater is it going to be if that's just the beginning? Fine linen and bright clean was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper. I love it. It says supper. Because I have been to a few weddings that just serve hors d'oeuvres. And that's okay. But we're going to a wedding supper <laughs> of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. It's just going to get better. Watch this. And I saw, this is Revelation 20, 1 through 6. I mean, please don't get bogged down in all these judgments that aren't going to happen to you. And then you're like, so I quit Revelation. And then you miss the end of the movie. Don't miss it. Listen to Revelation 20, 1 through 6. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that's the devil, the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Oh, if there's one person you want to hate in life, it's not your political adversary, it's Satan. Yeah, that's right. Jesus doesn't even have to do it himself. He sends an angel who binds him. For a thousand years, he threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Do you know that there's going to be a thousand years year reign on this earth where Satan is bound. So it's just going to be perfect on earth. And believers are going to rule and reign. If anyone asks you what you're doing, you just say, I'm an intern. Your whole life you're interning because this is our real ministry is when you rule and reign. Do you understand that you're going to be a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God ruling and reigning? Billy Graham, at 98 years old, having spoken to millions, was still an intern. His ministry had not begun. Our true ministry is ruling and reigning. If you hate your job now, just know that your job in the future, you're actually royalty. That's great 
new. This is my case for Christian escapism because some days our jobs stink. Some days we look at the world and it's painful. And you got to understand where we're heading. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and, and of Christ and will reign with them a thousand years. Let me finish with this. You ready? Now, this is Revelation 21. Oh, you thought 20 was good? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. After the thousand-year reign on earth, then there's a new heaven and a new earth. Everything's made new. How the earth is is not how it will be. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming together. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now you've got to hear this. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. Listen to this. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God. In the thousand year reign, Jesus was in Jerusalem sitting on the throne. But now, I, I mean, I, I was meditating on this yesterday and I just started weeping because now Father comes down. The one who created you, the one who dreamed of you, the one who loves you perfectly. Father is going to be with you. Father, Father is going to step in to the earth and the new heaven, and we will be with Father God. Are you following me? This is your great escape. This is not, this, stop, stop getting so wrapped up in what's going on. I mean, work, fight for Jesus, but this is not it. This is not it. There is a day. When Father comes and listens to what he does, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain. I know friends in this room that are battling sickness. They have pain in their bodies diabetes, cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, hepatitis, and, and MS, it's gone. It's gone. It's, there's no more pain. There's no more painful aging. There's no more dyslexia. There's no more depression. There's no more heartbreak. There's the marriages that were busted and broken and your, your heart has been ripped out. It's not there anymore. No, it's all that your prodigal children. That, it, that's that, the pain is gone. The war, the rape, the genocide, the famine, it's all gone. It's all gone. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Do you believe this? Because you're going to read the news this week and you're going to get discouraged, but you got to remember these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. There is coming a day when all the junk, all the pain is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. You talk about an inheritance. Jeff Bezos will look at your inheritance and weep because your inheritance will be so far greater. <laughs> And I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Yikes. That is the second death. Here's my summary. Don't give up. Here's my summary. Don't be afraid. 
Here's my summary statement. Don't be depressed, discouraged with the dismal thoughts about the future. Yeah, it's going to get worse. Jesus told us it's going to get worse. But then it's going to get better and better and better and better and better. That is your destiny. That is what you have to look forward to. That is your inheritance. That is where you are headed. And so you can have your head up high. Let's serve Jesus. Let's have on fire hearts for him. Let's believe for the nations to return. Let's be, believe for Israel to be restored. And let's believe that your end destination is to rule and reign with your loving Father in the presence of perfect love forever. Amen. Stand up.